Hi everyone, and welcome to this policy, policy exchange event, Delivering Net Zero, as part of policy exchanges beyond COP26 program. My name's Ed Burkett. I'm a senior research fellow in the Energy Environment Unit at Policy Exchange. So in this event today, we want to debate how the UK should achieve its legally binding target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel to discuss this challenge. It's been 13 years since the UK's Climate Change Act was passed in 2008, and between them, today's panelists has served as UK Energy Secretary for half of that time, either at the Department of Energy and Climate Change or at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. I'm joined today by the Right Honourable Dame Andrea Leadsom, MP, the Conservative Member of Parliament for South Northamptonshire, who served in a number of cabinet positions, including Secretary of State at DEFRA and Leader of the House of Commons. And in the energy space, she previously served as Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and a Minister of State for Energy. Also joined by the Right Honourable Ed Miliband, MP, who's the Labour Member of Parliament for Doncaster North. Between 2010 and 2015, he was Leader of the Opposition. He's currently Shadow Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and Shadow President for the COP26 Climate Conference. And he previously served as the UK's first Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change between 2008 and 2010. We're also joined by the Right Honourable Sir Ed Davey MP, the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament from Kingston and Surbiton and the leader of the Liberal Democrats. He previously served as Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in the coalition government between 2012 and 2015. And finally, we're joined by the Right Honourable Amber Rudd, who served as the Conservative Member of Parliament for Hastings and Rye between 20, 2010 and 2019. During that time, she held a number of cabinet positions, including Home Secretary and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. And in the energy and climate change space, she previously served as Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, and also as a Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Climate Change. So I want to start today by asking the panel for their assessment of the UK's progress towards net zero and for their priorities for the next phase of the UK energy and climate change policy. So I'll start with you, Andrea. Thanks, Ed. That was very impressive. What a bunch of colleagues. And actually, I want to start by paying huge tribute to these fabulous people because actually in the United Kingdom, I think one thing we can be really proud of is we have cross-party consensus on the fact that global climate change is the challenge of our generation and you know it's i think it's testament to the fact that we're all here speaking on the same platform that we all agree we might not necessarily agree about the route to get there but we all agree on the end goal that we have to tackle this and it is urgent it is a pressing priority so there's just a couple of things i would highlight um, from my time in energy jobs since 2015 and one of those is the importance of government setting out hard deadlines. So it seems to me that where government says you have to take coal off the system by 2025, as Amber and I did back in 2015, and where the government says you have to have zero emissions from the tailpipe by 2030, as we have done in the, in the, in the um, public um, car and, and light vehicle space, those things significantly help. And what you see is businesses immediately settle down to making it happen. So my first, where do we go from here, is we need to see much more of that in every area from home heating to transportation to aviation to shipping. We need to see those deadlines and then we need route maps which government can support but needs to allow the creativity of the private sector to then get stuck in. But I would just like to add my last thoughts about beyond COP26 specifically and here I've got three big asks of governments around the world. The first one is to get together to create an international kite mark for carbon offsetting. Because the reality is people do want to go on holiday, they do need to travel for family and business reasons, and if we could do that, that would really enable people to feel good about themselves whilst we make this transition. Secondly, I would like to see our government working with some big emitters to do some amazing things. So one example could be working with China to perhaps produce 200 gigawatts of offshore wind power around the world by, say, 2030. That kind of big initiative could really send a very, very strong message. And then thirdly, I would like to see government doing much more about the retail space. So we know that young people, you know, when I was 13, I used to lie awake at night worrying about a nuclear war. Today's young people lie awake worrying about is the world going to end because of what 
previous generations have done to our climate. I would like to see us helping them to reduce their own carbon footprint via perhaps a, a kind of a retail app so that you can look at your own lifestyle, how you do things and how you could do them better in the future. So I'll leave it there, but thanks very much for having us, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here with Policy Exchange. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and on to Ed Miliband. Uh, how, how are we doing and what do we need to do next? Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, and it's um, very good to be here with my fellow uh, the former uh, energy secretaries. I'm not sure what you call what the collective noun for a group of en former energy secretaries is. Um, has been, a gigaton, <laughs> or has been, has, has beens or a gigaton. Um, uh, but but um, look, I would endorse what Andrea says. I mean, you know, one thing that is very important about the UK debate is we may disagree about speed, we may disagree about route, but we don't disagree about the problem. Um, uh, and that's been true since the Climate Change Act and indeed before. And I think that is a very important point. I think the second sort of preliminary thing I would say, though, is that I think we should be incredibly worried about where we are as a world and as a country. Um, you know, we've got to halve global emissions this, this decade as a world uh, if we're to keep 1.5 degrees alive, as we all agree uh, we should. And we are way, way off that. The Climate Action Tracker had something come out this morning say that only the Gambia of all countries in the world is actually doing what is necessary. Um, and I think they're pulling up the UK on delivery rather than on the target. But I think it's sort of, I think it is, should make us quite uh, sort of anxious about where we are. And we may want to get into COP. I, I've got three things domestically that I think are um, uh, important uh, as sort of next steps uh, and what needs to happen. I think the first is finance. I think I suspect all of us uh, as energy secretaries would have the experience that if the Treasury is not on board, it makes life very, very difficult. And I think, I think the Rubicon that I would urge the government to cross is to recognize the, reali the fiscal reality, which is the most unaffordable, irresponsible thing you can do is not to invest now in tackling the problem. And that's everything from home retrofit to greening the steel industry to partnering with the car industry. And of course, and of course you know, this is about private investment, but it's also about public investment as a way to lever in private investment. And we see what Joe Biden is seeking to do in the US. And I think that that is the sort of, and, and, and there's different estimates of the investment gap. Um, some people say 20 billion, some people say 30 billion a year, but whatever the investment gap is, I think it needs to be filled. And that isn't to undermine the role of the private sector, it's actually to complement the role of the private sector. Uh, secondly, and I think this very much reflects what Andrea says, a policy is not a plan. So take 2030, the 2030 ICE phase out. I really applaud the government for having done the ICE phase out. But, but then there's a whole set of questions that arise about the skills of the workforce, what's going to happen to the existing workforce, how are we going to have the gigafactory so that we have the production in this country. And I'd be urging government to come up with a plan uh, with industry which actually doesn't just do the phase out date but does the route to the phase out date and what it what it's going to mean and I think think you're going to need that right across the board I think there are plans for a net zero plan to come out uh, later on uh, this year and then the, the the third thing I would say and again maybe this reflects our experience is this has got to be cross government and I think this it's better than it was but it's still not there so you can't really be doing deals with Australia on trade where you then say, well, you don't need to have your temperature, uh, you don't need to be bound to temperature uh, commitments. You can't really be saying, well, maybe we should open a new coal mine. Uh, because the problem is you look like you're sort of facing both ways. And I think, I think sort of rooting this in the whole, and similarly, you shouldn't be cutting, in my view, overseas aid, not just for the moral reason, but because it's fatally undermining our moral standing as the COP26 hosts. You know, so, so, you know, I sort of applaud any progress the government makes. I think it's good that they're setting ambitious targets. But I think this is, for, you know, if this really is the emergency that we all on this stage believe it is, it's got to be every government department and it's got to be treated like an emergency. And you can't have policy that faces in one direction while you're trying to do things in the, in the other direction. So that would be my advice to government about what they need to do. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and same question to Ed Davey. Um, it's amazing. I'm agreeing with everything that's been said, which is always good. Um, but let me give a little take on uh, what Andrea and Ed said about deadlines. I think it's really important for, for, uh, for deadlines ahead so people can innovate and compete 
to, to meet those standards. But there's a, got to be careful, and actually, Ed, you addressed this brilliantly in the Climate Change Act. You've got to have milestones along the way. Otherwise, you get into NIMTO, not in my term of office. So it's really easy for prime ministers, I can't think who, to set a nice target uh, a little way away. But it's not in my term of office, or not in his term of office, uh, you know, not a lot happens. And there's no plan in the way you're calling for. So we've got to avoid NIMTO, but we've also got to be ambitious in our targets. We've also got to take on those people who say this is all too expensive. You know, I, f I face that, a lot of criticism of Secretary of State. Oh, you can't do these renewables. When I signed the first big contract for uh, an offshore wind farm at £160 per megawatt hour, all too expensive, you can't do it. It's it got lots of criticism for it. Because of the policies we put in, which brought in the private sector, that had competition and innovation, you know, the price of offshore wind you know, fell at one of the auctions to under £40 per megawatt hour in a very short period. You know, innovation, if you engage the private sector properly, you can get the price down. So when I read people complaining about the price, it, it, what they should complain about is the policies aren't good enough to get the price down. Because we can get the price down. We've shown it time and time again. And do you know what? Those offshore wind farms and all the renewable contracts that I signed and my successor signed, those CFDs, they're now paying back to the consumer. Last night, the wholesale price of electricity rose to £200 per megawatt hour because of the shortage of gas. So the renewable plants are paying back the subsidies. So they are super competitive. Uh, and, and I think that shows that we, we, where the path is to decarbonizing power. My three points on what we need to do are on heat, on transport or on finance and on heat it's energy efficiency I mean you know we uh, messed around with something called the Green Deal I can talk you through the rights and wrongs of the Green Deal what we learned what we need is uh, um, a very strong NIMTO we need some regulations and targets to really hit them that are biting and we've we've rode back on those you know we got rid of the zero carbon homes uh, regulation for example uh, energy efficiency is the low-hanging fruit, and we still don't take it. It just doesn't make sense. And uh, I think we need to go hell for leather on energy efficiency while we try to understand the eclectic mix of heating systems that we need. And it is eclectic. In my own constituency, I'm uh, really advocating a what I call a poo-to-power plant using uh, a lo the local sewage works to heat a social housing estate and a hospital and a school. So, you know, let's look at these different heating systems, but let's get energy efficiency right now because it's, uh, it's a no-regret strategy. On transport, I think we've got to be more visionary. And we've seen the Britain's aerospace industry, which there are so many jobs, uh, really under the cosh. They've had a really tough time. And they're going to keep having a tough time. So when we talk about supporting it, why don't we support it by saying, look, let's get a zero carbon uh, aerospace industry. Let us invest in green flight. Let's be the world leading green flight. We're now the world leading offshore wind. We've shown we can do it. Let's Final thing on finance. This is important not just for the UK, but for the world. Um, uh, Ed and I are, are joining on the All Party Party Group on Sustainable Finance, and we've talked about this. I talked about this with the Secretary of State, that we need to, to realise that there's a carbon bubble. Yep. Huge amounts of money, your money and mine, are invested in fossil fuels through the pensions industry and through the insurance industry. Huge amounts of money. Definitely. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of those investments aren't going to make returns. Indeed, if you look at the past 50 years, if you'd invested in other things other than fossil fuels, your investments would have uh, had just the same returns. In the next 50 years, if you're investing in fossil fuels now, your returns will be lower than investing in other things. And I think our regulators, the FCA, the Bank of England, the Treasury, are not acting fast enough. Mark Carney has given a good lead, but we should go further. And we should be saying whether it's the listings uh, on the stock exchange for new ex uh, oil and gas exploration, or indeed uh, London being the global capital of financing the global coal industry, we should be saying no. We need to take finance out of fossil fuels and switch it into all these green uh, options which frankly are going to yield better returns more mean that your and my pensions will actually be worth something. Great, thanks Ed. And then finally to Amber. Thank you very much. Um, the world has transformed in terms of its approach to climate change since I was Secretary of State five years ago and attending the Paris Climate Change Conference. 
At that point, for a lot of people, it was a slight, uh, it was on the edge of their vision, really, climate change, what needed to happen, and the climate change conference that was taking place. Now it feels completely changed, that it is at the centre, not just of politicians' vision, but of the public's vision. And we now have the tools to deal with that as well. In the past few years, there's been such extraordinary developments in terms of the cost and the technology to deliver, some of which Ed talked about in Offshore Wind, but it's actually an incredibly exciting area as well in terms of the opportunities there are for jobs, for investment, for growth. So I think when we look at this, and I, I think the Prime Minister is right when he talks about this, we're not just talking about a cost, we're talking about an extraordinary opportunity for, for this country to lead in an area where so many other countries are following. And the other th big change since the past five years is the evidence of climate change. Everywhere we look now, terrible floods, terrible heat, fires all over the world. And so I think the public support for real action has completely changed as well. My theme is the same as what my colleagues have just spoken of, really, which is that it's no longer about targets, it's all about delivery. Uh, targets have been embraced, they are sometimes a little far out, as Ed has pointed out, but now we have to concentrate on how we actually deliver on these pledges and promises that people expect to be delivered. And I have two points to make. One is the continued reform of the power sector, and the second is a more regional approach. I remember in 2015, in my, in my day, we were looking at the reform of the power sector even then. What else could be done? One of the reasons the UK has succeeded is because it's a pretty liberalised market. But it's going to have to do much better going forward. There is so much that's going to go onto these grids. Electric vehicles, heat pumps, how are we going to get the demand management right That How are we going to show the right price signals so that people do charge their electric cars at the right time? How can we have a system where you can have uh, electric vehicle batteries aggregated and then perhaps put back onto the grid at some time? None of this is really available now. Some of it's beginning to be available. There's some great work being done by Octopus Energy with Kraken. There's all sorts of small developments taking place. But we need much more advanced development of the power sector itself to deliver on this. Regional approaches. Up and down the country, there are local authorities making pledges for net zero. But they have very few tools to actually do anything about that. Let's try and find a way of giving them those tools. If we want to have heat networks, it's a very different heat work network you try and put in place in London than you might have put in place in somewhere like Hastings. And you're going to have to have planning rules. Carbon capture and storage is going to require local support, local council planning to try and really get the best out of it. How do we empower regional areas, the mayors, for instance, to really be able to deliver on that? And again, perhaps to get price uh, accurate price recording locally rather than having a slightly flimsy international system that we have at the moment. So I would say reform of the power sector and regional approaches are the key to really in the future making sure that we use our energy wisely because there is an incredibly exciting opportunity out there. We're not just talking about how to get clean energy onto the grid. We're talking about smart energy. A lot of what we're talking about is just a digital opportunity. And the UK has done well in this sector and can do better. There are so many opportunities if we can get the best controls in place, the best um, outcome for consumers. Because at the end of the day, all of this has to be supported by consumers. Consumers have to want this to take place, have to embrace it, and we have to make sure, this, as myself former, and these actual politicians, that they support the politics of it. Because otherwise you get the old phrase of politicians know what to do, they just don't know how to get re-elected after they've done it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Amber. So I just want to bring in uh, the panel for a bit of a discussion before we go to Q&A. So if you are joining us virtually, please do uh, raise your virtual hand, and then if you're in the room, please raise your physical hand uh, at, at the right time. Um, Amber, I just want to go back to something you said there about... Uh, reform of the electricity sector. It's quite a. It's basically quite technical and frankly quite boring. I'm uh, so sorry, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's but a very good policy exchange paper. It, well, there it? is, there is. But if you are, so if you were the current Secretary of State, you've got the Prime Minister's 10-point plan to deliver, you've got uh, manifesto commitments on carbon capture and storage. How, how do you get something that's so technical and, and quite dry and maybe not that many votes, how do you get that to the top of your agenda? Well, 
I think he's got to, he's a very good salesman. So I would hope to make the point to him that the opportunity here is for the consumers to spend less money. Um, Ed knows all about uh, price freezes, for instance. Um, the point is to make sure that the consumer is the person who's going to benefit from it. If you had a better price reflective model on the power grid, then consumers would be able to save money. That's how I'd say I'd sell it to him. Okay, great. And then just, just picking up on that, uh, that cost point uh, you mentioned there. So costs in the electricity sector and gas sector are, are rocketing at the moment, um, the wholesale prices, and that is feeding through into domestic energy bills. Um, Ed Miliband, you were one of the early proponents of, of the energy price cap that is now there and is cushioning. We're all living in a Marxist universe, <laughs> to quote David Cameron. Uh, um, so, so what is the right response to the current increases <laughs> in electricity and gas prices and how it feeds through to domestic bills? I mean, look, look some of this is international, but the, the, it seems to me that the key from, uh, from my analysis of the situation is, one, uh, diversification is incredibly important. So if you think about the renewable power sources we have, we of course need wind, we need solar, we need tidal, uh, we're also going to need in, among zero carbon sources nuclear, so you need as broad a portfolio of zero carbon sources as possible, um, and you've got, a you've got a really motor on it. And then secondly, and I think it goes back to something that, uh, that Ed said, I mean, the retrofit uh, energy efficiency agenda it seems to me the, be the, the absolute sort of no-brainer policy that there is here because it's, you know, it's job creating, it uh, cuts the amount of uh, uh, electricity or gas that you use, uh, and uh, crucially, it obviously uh, helps in terms of carbon emissions. So I, think, so I think I think it's a combination of diversification of your power sources uh, and energy efficiency. Okay, and do you think, I, I guess those will take a bit of a while to come through, uh, do you think there's any case for any action in the immediate term, perhaps before the energy price cap is updated uh, in advance of April next year? As in, what, what, when you say action? Well, some sort of action to keep down energy bills. I think you should look at all of the options that you've got available, definitely, because I think it's going to be a real worry for consumers this, this, this winter. Yeah, just, just to add, I think Ed's exactly right, and what we've not talked about yet is this huge green jobs opportunity and actually retrofitting is not just the low hanging fruit that saves you money, stops you heating the atmosphere, saves carbon emissions, but it also does create masses of job opportunities. And, and that is something that, you know, studies, when I was uh, Bay's Secretary of State, we had a study done with young people who more than 70% of them were saying of preference they would like a job in a green economy. And of course the beauty of the green economy is you have jobs ranging from apprenticeships for school leavers in perhaps retrofitting homes all the way through to retraining for oil and gas engineers to perhaps work on offshore wind turbines all the way up to sort of brilliant science in blue hydrogen or even in, in nuclear mm. technologies. So it really is right across the UK geographically and right across the sort of capability range, a huge opportunity for jobs and growth. And that's just at home. So, I mean, I completely agree with both Eds, actually, extraordinarily. Amber's going to agree as well, I just know it, that retrofitting is really low-hanging fruit. Uh, I mean, I bear some of the scars, as I think uh, Ed and Andrea do as well, about difficulties in getting retrofitting, yes. green homes grants and the Green Deal and all that. Um, I would try and do it regionally. I mean, the more I reflect on it, the more, you know, if you, gave, you, if you fund the mayors to deliver on it, you're much like, more likely to get the public support. You're much more, more likely to get it locally delivered. So I think that on, on heat and on transport, the real opportunity is using regional power. I wonder whether there are any lessons on green jobs from the offshore wind boom that we've seen. We've got the highest installed capacity of offshore wind in the world, still in the UK. Um, but it does seem like a lot of money now is going into making sure more of those jobs are, are in the UK. I wonder whether any of the panel will reflect yeah, on that. Yeah, this uh, um, you've got to get the supply chain uh, to grow even faster. I mean, we had a massive uh, row um, about getting Siemens to Hull. We managed to get it over the line, and that was a really so important for that whole Humberside uh, area and you've got a cluster with what's happening in Hull and Grimsby and so on. Um, but I still worry that we're not doing enough uh, to get those supply chain jobs here um, and we've just got to have a, a strategy. I mean there is the, the off, off, offshore wind uh, sector Council. deal um, which um, you know has got some good things. But give me an example, um, 
I think there's a strategic sector which is never talked about because it's really dull, uh, and that's cabling. Cabling is one of the most significant supporting sectors for renewable uh, industry, whether it's the offshore wind cables or, 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 or other cables and um, interconnectors and so on. And there's a, a real ind industrial opportunity there, uh, but that does need some some strategic industrial approach, just as green flight would. And you know, we, the prime minister's you know very keen on you know, tunnels between Scotland and Northern Ireland and, and, and other things like that. I'd be keen on uh, trying to build up world-leading sectors as we did in offshore wind. Yeah. Uh, can I just interject here as the only Brexit here on the panel that uh, one of the things that frustrated me back in 2015 was that um, exactly as Ed says, we didn't have a UK supply chain for supporting offshore wind. So the CFDs are being paid to lovely Danish companies, lovely everything but British companies, and all of the parts were being produced in lovely European countries using coal-fired power stations and then shipped here on dirty diesel ships. And when I asked, can we do anything about this could we count the entire carbon footprint of the supply chain and I was told no because as a member of the European Union you have to allow procurement from across the EU so actually that is a little Brexit dividend as we could actually now be very carefully counting the carbon footprint of the entire supply chain and making sure that that's taken into account in the pricing. Ed, Ed Miliband? Yeah just on the um just on this industrial policy question which both Ed and Andrea have reflected on I think this is absolutely fundamental and it goes to something that we haven't really discussed, which is a just transition for workers as well as consumers. And look, you know, I think Amber is completely right about this, that we've got to, this has got to be fair to take consumers with us. This is why I'm very cautious about some of the tax ideas that there are, because the danger is they end up being regressive. Uh, and you don't take people with you and you don't deserve to take people with you. But, and it's equally true in relation to workers. So the question that lots of uh, fossil fuel workers would ask is, well, if in the long term I'm not going to be in work, what job is going to be available yeah. for me? And am I going to have a job in offshore wind, uh, for example? You know, what's the terms and conditions of that job? How does it compare to my current job? And, and I think, you know, I actually think that sort of all of us have got to be, and I would hope government would be as well, be focused very much more on this than we are. And that, but that requires you to have an industrial policy to ensure that we do have the jobs in this country and it's true in relation to offshore wind i think it's also true in relation to steel for example i think it's true in relation to uh, the car industry we have a incredibly proud a car industry we should be incredibly proud of but it's facing an ambitious target and a massive transition and i think sort of in all these areas we've got to really watch you know what are the alternatives we are offering people what is the tr what are we nurturing industries and people through this transition so I wonder specifically, uh, Ed Davey, yeah. I, I feel I've just got to uh, deal with the Brexit point. You won't be surprised. Um, I've never found any European rules got in the way of uh, supporting the massive expansion of renewables in the supply sector response that we uh, got. And I would say the reason why Denmark has been so successful in wind was because I visited the first ever onshore wind farm uh, in the world. It was in uh, in Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't taken forward by a uh, former energy secretary, Nigel Lawson, and they went to Denmark, and Denmark have got the best onshore wind industry. So big mistake back back, back then, predating uh, Brexit. The, the problem with Brexit, actually, for, for, for renewables and for uh, zero carbon is our inability to uh, develop our interconnectors more effectively. Because when you look at energy policy and how Brexit really affects it, it's about trading, about trading electrons. And um, uh, I was really keen on, on uh, interconnectors, and we managed to persuade Statnet and National Grid to go for the NSN, which is uh, coming into operation next year, which will link the UK to Norwegian um, hydropower. Uh, so we'll have a green battery in North Norway, and that is absolutely fantastic use of interconnectors. Um, but now, if you look at the way interconnectors are going, uh, we're, we're, we're on the back, you know, we're right at the back of the queue now. We were at the front of a queue on interconnectors. Uh, we're now at the back of a queue thanks to Brexit. And that's really bad news because when you're trying to manage a system that's got a lot of renewables deployed on it, whether it's solar or wind or whatever it is, if you're trading in a bigger market, you've got more liquidity. So one of the problems of Brexit, as in many areas, it's reduced the size of the market we trade in, and that's inefficient. inefficient. It, it means less competition, less innovation, less price transparency, and less security. And um, that's the biggest damage, to, I think, uh, to 
Britain's power system and our, our ability to go forward, our, in, 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 our not inability, because we will be able to trade, but our inability to influence and to expand our ability to trade in, the, in Europe's single power market. Okay, great. Thanks, Ed. I, I want to just uh, come back to electric vehicles at Ed Miliband. It was something that you mentioned. Uh, the government has set out some elements of a plan. It's set out an automotive transformation fund for factories. It's set out a proposed regulatory framework with a California-style zero-emission vehicle mandate to deliver the phase-out. And there's an EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure strategy that is, that is due. Uh, so what more specifically would you like to I see? Mean, I'd, I'd say area? two things in particular. The Faraday Institute says we need, I think it's seven uh, gigafactories. Um, with uh, one or two, probably two, heading towards two. My sense is about the scale of government support. And, and look, this should be, I actually goes back to something Amber said, this could be done through um, uh, regional um, investment. It could be done through equity stakes taken by uh, public-private partnerships with equity stakes taken by uh, some of our city regions. But we need to scale up quickly. We're, we're in a to be clear about this question, it is accentuated by the issue of uh, the um, uh, sort of Brexit and some of the arrangements in relation to Brexit, is we are in a global race which is going to be determined in the next one or two years about where the electric vehicles are made. And, and the urgency is now. Uh, it's not in five years' time, it's now. So we've said, we suggested a, a significantly bigger investment than the government has suggested to, to make sure we get three more gigafactories, this parliament, uh, partnering with the private sector to make them happen. There's also an issue about grid connection. So that's one thing. Secondly, on the charging infrastructure, I mean, the regional inequalities in relation to this charging infrastructure are terrible. I mean, actually, I, I, we've said that the, um, the green investment, the new investment bank, uh, should actually have a responsibility to start funding some of this infrastructure to, to, to deal with some of that. Thirdly, I would say, I would worry about the incentives for consumers um, and whether the incentives for consumers there so that, so that are there so that it's not just the richest who can afford to, to go electric. So, for example, we've said long-term zero-interest loans to make it possible so, so people can afford the upfront cost. You, you make a saving. Uh, obviously, electric vehicles do actually cost less to run, and you make a saving over time, which you can then allows you to pay the loan back. I'm open to different suggestions, but so, so, uh, so I think some of what the government is doing is good, but I, I talk to the manufacturers quite a lot, and they don't feel there is a sufficient plan in place, particularly on this gigafactories issue. Okay, great. Uh, I'll come to the audience in a second. I just want to finish on an institutional question. Uh, so, Amber, you were, and Ed, you were both, Ed Dave, you were both in the uh, Department for Energy and Climate Change, and actually Ed Miliband as well, um, but that's now been merged into the business department in, in Bayes. Um, given how many cross-government issues there are related to energy and climate policy, do you want to see, do you think we would benefit from a dedicated government department uh, focused on, on delivering um, our net zero target? Well, and when you introduced me, you kindly said that I'd had a, a few different roles in government in my time. And one thing I learned is that whoever is going to have that role, if we did have a new department, which was energy and, cl energy and climate change, it would have to be a really senior cabinet minister, a kind of like a deputy prime minister, a first secretary of state, so they have the authority to really try to make sure that every department realises they have a responsibility. There's no point having it as a junior department on its own. Uh, it's actually stronger at the moment within Bayes, I would say. Um, so I would love to see it with more weight. If, you're going to, if, we, if, if, if the government were going to do that, they've got to put one of the most senior cabinet ministers in it and give them some time to really make sure that they stay in that role, um, which is, I don't know who that would be, we don't know who it is, might be by the end of today in these different roles. So um, it, it's a good idea as long as it's got a senior role. The problem with uh, energy and climate change in Bayes, it's neither fish nor fowl. It's neither focused on energy and climate change or focused on the really big picture of net zero. So you've either got to have someone that's completely focused on driving forward the energy agenda, which is still the biggest agenda because it's covering heat, it's covering transport, it's covering, covering, covering power, uh, or, or you've got to go really big in the way that Amber uh, suggested. And you know, I'd like to see um, Secretary of State for Net Zero, which has all the uh, issues which we know have got to be tackled. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's extremely senior minister because um, the, the, the lack of focus on Bayes, because I mean, Bayes is struggling with all the, the challenges of, of, of coming out of the single market and um, it's busy trying to find a few lorry drivers. Would you say, <laughs> Secretary of State for Net Zero, what, what would that 
Well, it could, could, could add to transport, it could lose ha housing. It would have to be, have to be bigger because, as you know as well as I do, that uh, energy, you're effectively doing power and heating. Um, even on energy efficiency, you know, I had to talk to Eric Pickles. You know, I was trying to get a minimum energy efficiency regulation for the private renter sector. I eventually did. Is a book about how I managed to achieve it. Uh, I was told by uh, my good friend uh, Eric Pickles, uh, who called me his old chum. Uh, uh, he said Means that you've your name. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, probably. He said uh, that regulations were communist. I said um, thou that was the line back in those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I said, thou shalt not kill us regulation, uh, and it came for Karl Marx. Ed, do you want to come in on that? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something unusual for a politician, because I'm not sure what I think about this. Um, I, I'm sort of in two minds. So, so I was, um, obviously, was the first Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, and I sat in a sort of, tight, you know, we had to find an office. It was, it, setting up a department is not a joke uh, from, from the sort of get-go. You know, it is, it, the, the transitional costs are big, and, you know, in Bayes, you've, you've got, You've got levers, you know. That said, I sort of take the points that, that Ed and I think Amber are making. So, so I, I sort of I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure what I think about this. I mean, I think there's I think you can sort of see the arguments uh, both ways. I think I would I think I would worry a bit about ending up in a situation where you have a sort of smaller shorn down climate department, which is then up against the successor to Bayes and the Treasury together. And then you're sort of fighting on two fronts rather than one. So I think that's the, I think that's the sort of that's the question. I think that's the question. I agree with Ed. That's the, that is the problem. You end up being a small department. Agree with Amber. If you if if it was going to be incredibly powerful, that would be one thing. But unfortunately, it wouldn't be because it's not a big operational issue in the way that other departments are. So it runs the risk then of being the sort of poor relation. I mean, actually, is the one who was Bayes secretary on, on this panel, what I did was to change Bayes' objectives to the UK leading the world in tackling global climate change and all of our business objectives came under that. So I think that's sort of the closest you could get to using that mandate of that bigger department to actually focus on the objectives. Okay, great. So we'll come to questions now. We have uh, questions in the room and also online. Um, so you just have to state your name and your organisation, and then you can ask any question you want, um, but please keep it short, and then we'll put that to our panel. Thanks very much. Uh, is this on? Uh, Clem Calton from Octopus Energy. So thanks very much, Amber, for the <laughs> shout-outs. Uh, I also campaigned um, for Octopus on the energy price cap, so big fan of your work as well, Ed. Um, I would like to talk about price signals and jobs actually picking up from what, what you said, Amber, and totally agree that, that the need for kind of dyna dynamic price signals in the electricity sector is, is the thing that's really holding back our, our ability to kind of take advantage of the, of the benefits of, of net zero. Um, but that there is another price signal that's getting in the way, and that is um, the distinction or the, well, the difference between the cost of electricity and the cost of gas. Um, so Octopus Energy, we've, we've actually created, you know, on the subject of green jobs, we've created 1,500 green jobs in the past five years, and we would like to create many more, including um, a thousand, training 1,000 heat pump engineers per year. We've just invested £10 million in a heat pump um, innovation and R&D centre. The thing holding us back from that investment and from really kind of turbocharging that is the fact that um, we have a syntax on the clean bit of your energy bill. So in a dual fuel energy bill, all of the cost for renewables deployment sits on the electricity bit rather than the gas bit. How can we overcome that? Um, and how can we do it in a way that, you know, how can we do it quickly? I know also just, um, by the way, Ed, so you might want to respond to this in particular, is that um, GMB today have come out um, campaigning against uh, decarbonisation of heat. So, you know, we've got, a, we've got a real kind of problem on both sides of, of the aisle there. Okay, so um, policy costs on electricity and gas and uh, sort of boiler bans and uh, people complaining about the prospect of boilers being, being ripped out. So who wants to go first? Well, I, I could say something about the decarbonisation of heat and the GMB, if I may, <laughs> which is that surely they've come out against it because they think it's just going to be expensive and it's back to Ed's point, which is where you're going to put the costs. 
So I would say that you know, government has to make sure that in order to deliver this, the costs are fairly distributed so that you do take everybody with you. Um, and, I, and I would hope to see them do that. Uh, every now and again, you hear from the government that they're going to look again at where the, at the charges are, whether they're in gas or electricity. And I hope that they embrace that at some stage and take some action, because I agree, it looks increasingly like they're taxing the wrong element of it. Okay, David. What I'm really interested in is seeing the impact on those charges of the fact that um, fossil fuel electricity has been higher than the cost of um, renewable electricity in recent months. I mean, um, the CFDs, for those who don't know, that we developed and pushed through, it would have been at the sort of forefront of seeing this massive increase in renewable power, particularly offshore wind. Uh, if the price in the general market, which is normally set by gas at the moment, goes above the strike price, that renewable power plant gets the wholesale price, but has to pay back to the consumer the difference between the wholesale price and the strike price. So at the moment, uh, because wholesale prices are so high because of fossil fuel prices, uh, these green power generators are paying back to the consumer. I want to see that uh, landing on people's consumer bills. So consumer bills are cheaper. The consumers have supported this incredible growth of renewable power. Now renewable power is super competitive, more competitive than fossil fuels, even without a carbon tax. It can pay back. This is a fantastic story for renewables, and we should, consumers deserve to see the benefits of it. I mean, on the question about workers and the uh, unions, I, I think actually Amber is right on this, which is this is about the nature of the transition and, and showing that workers are going to be treated properly in this process. And I think this and I think that's this is why I said what I said earlier on, that this is this just transition issue is incredibly important for us to to answer. This transition, we are gonna have to uh, have a transition. It, it's a question of how it is handled and how it has handled in a fair way. And I think we owe the people who work in industries, work on uh, gas boilers and so on, an answer to that uh, uh, to that question on the differential question, I know the government is uh, struggling with this, and you've got to you've got to look in detail at this. Again, I would say you've got to. Th there's no easy way to answer this in the abstract because we're in this position that we're in. We've got to find a way of navigating our way through this in a way that is fair. And you know, we've had this earlier discussion about what's happening to wholesale gas prices and so on. So we're going to have to navigate our way through this thicket, um, and it goes back to this fairness principle. You've got to find a way to make that transition fair. Okay, great. I wonder if I can take a virtual question from Brett Amflit. Brett, can you hear us? Thank you very much, uh, Ed, number three, and thank you to all the guests for having put up with me when they were ministers badgering them about home insulation, boilers, so, heat pumps and Brett, heating controls. Brett, what's your organisation, please, and then a short question. Um, my question from the Builders Merchants Federation uh, is, what's your message to the people who are sitting on the motorway today and yesterday are trying to raise the idea of home insulation to government. What's your message to those people, please? Who wants to come in on that? It won't help, is my message to them. I think it's the wrong way to go about it, and they are not making... I don't think... I, I mean, they're presumably doing it to make progress. In my view, it'll make zero progress and just make people irritated. OK. Um, maybe we'll take another question uh, from the room. Uh, yeah, question down here. Hi, I'm David Blackman representing uh, Utility Week magazine. Um, just got a question. Uh, this morning, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have woken up to find their supply has gone, has, 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 has gone bust. Um, what... Which one's that, sorry? Who's sorry, bust? people's supplies. energy. Which ones are they? Sorry, I know one's people's energy. I can't remember. Sorry, I haven't got the other one off the top of my head. Anyway, it's, 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 sort of, it's in the hundreds of thousands of, of, of customers. Um, what kind of sort of potential bailout would do, do, do you believe, or sort of what, or, or, or potential take, or sanct sanctions, or, or even perhaps special administration measures should the government introduce um, to, to, to deal with, with, with these problems? And you should. Sorry, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's you're you're absolutely right. There is a there is an issue now. The the sort of the good news is that there are many more players in the market and uh, organisations like Octopus who are thinking outside the box, which you know all credit to them for that. 
but obviously then there is a risk that once you move into a much more um, uh, varied type of market that some will go bust. As you'll know at the moment, the rule is that uh, other providers come in to pick up the slack straight away and that so far has worked well where we've seen the occasional collapse of an energy company but the really important thing is that people do switch and it's been a bit like in the banking sector people don't move banks they don't move and they don't move energy suppliers and that is so much to their detriment so going back to the earlier question which I didn't answer I think transparency on bills of what you are spending on what parts of power versus some um, subsidies and so on but likewise much more encouragement to actually move your energy supplier to get the best possible deal because there's a real problem for people's energy bills and, and that is ongoing we've not really managed to solve that yet but having more providers is part of the answer I do wonder whether any of the panel think um, that the energy price cap in some way contributes to this I mean it's, it's not clear that that is the main driver but do you think in the long term we should be looking to remove the energy price cap, which was always billed as a temporary measure when it came in? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have mixed feelings about the cap. Um, on the one hand, of course, I like the fact that it saves people money. On the other hand, I literally thought, oh, great, I don't have to switch now. Uh, I, because I knew that I wasn't going to be ripped off by just going onto the variable rate. Uh, but I understand that for sort of challenger organisations, the cap has been good because it stops bigger organisations being able to get all their profits from ripping people off, so it becomes a more competitive environment for challenger suppliers. Um, you know, m my view is we need to study to see whether or not consumers have benefited from this cap or not. There's a reasonable question, I think we would all agree, let's look at the evidence as opposed to, you know, uh, what it might get good headlines. I uh, was sceptical uh, about that, but I'd like to see the evidence. Has it really... Uh, benefited and when I was looking at uh, the evidence on prices um, I was particularly struck by the evidence and I'm talking evidence that British gas with about I think it's 40 percent of the market the British home domestic gas market was making significantly higher profits uh, than elsewhere and there was real evidence of market abuse so I called the Secretary of State I forgot to tell number 10, which was a bit of a mistake, but I called uh, number te uh, the 10 o'clock news for British Gas to be broken up. Uh, and what I really was arguing for was more competition in the market because it did seem to me that British Gas was abusing its position and that was a structural reason yeah. about why uh, prices were higher than they needed to be for a lot of people. And when you looked at the customers of British Gas, which, which I did, a lot of them were uh, uh, people who were not used to switching. Uh, and they were getting a bad deal and the, the former monopoly supplier was exploiting the fact that they were called British Gas um, and seemed to therefore be cuddly and nice. Um, so you know, th that the so that's a sort of evidence-based analysis of how we drive prices down that I'd like to see. Great, so I think we've got time for one more question from in the room. I think there was a chap down here who wanted to ask a question. Yeah, so name an organisation and a short question. Thanks. Hi, I'm David Halpern from Pavel Insight Team. And there's a nudge unit. Um, we have an interesting paradox at the moment. You touch on public attitudes. On the one hand, you've got the, the, you know, the, the CCC saying 62% of change has to be behavioural or whatever. Um, and we've got 92%, I think, people in the UK now say um, you know, government should um, enforce uh, you know, Paris and so on. But I think there's a, there's a softness in the view about those attitudes, including amongst many politicians, which is that do the public really, really mean that? So what do you do with this kind of, I guess, how, how how deep do you really think the public sentiment is behind it? And what do you do with this sort of uncertainty around, you know, are we going to say to people you can't eat meat? Or what is the actual ask we make politically of the public? OK, I wonder if a couple of people want to come in here. Ed Miliband? I mean, look, David, you know so much more about this than uh, I do in terms of the behavioural issues. But it seems to me that the key thing on this is that system change makes possible individual change. So in other words, do you have a set of incentives that makes it fair for people and makes it possible for people to make the change. You see, you see I look at the heat and buildings difficulties, putting it sort of politely, that the government's facing, and I, and I think to myself, look, partly, I hate to sort of blame the Treasury for this, but I mean, partly, unless you find a way of collectivising some of these costs, you're always going to face horrendous fairness issues. And this is the one case, I really want to emphasise this point, 
the normal argument against borrowing to invest is we're going to burden future generations. The opposite argument applies here. Because in other words, if we invest now, it saves money down the line for future generations by tackling the problem. There's a brilliant OBR report on this saying that the costs of not acting, of delaying by a decade, double the cost because you lock in high carbon. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I sort of think if I had the Rishi Sunak or the Treasury here, I'd say, look, you know, the, the most unaffordable, irresponsible choice here is not to invest. And I think that the problem that ministers elsewhere are facing is they're saying, well, we, we can't confront these fairness issues unless we have some role for government in, in, in sort of defraying the costs and collectivising the costs. But then if you make it fair for people, I think they do want to make the transition. I think people get it. But they're saying, is it going to be done on the right terms? Okay, we've just got to get people in quickly sure, here. So, sorry. Amber, do you want I to tell No, I think I was, you, you spoke so well about that, Ed. I mean, I agree with that in terms of... It reveals slightly that perhaps some people at the top of government don't actually appreciate the urgency of this, and we need them to do that. But I would add one other thing, which I don't think is really getting through, which is there's a lot of talk about the cost of this, but actually there are there genuinely are, and there's some remarkable opportunities Definitely. for not just the, the British public, but for people who want to really thrive in this area, the Definitely. jobs, and the fact that UK has become the leader in offshore wind. There were all sorts of Definitely. other areas. So I would ra much rather we try to turn it a bit towards demonstrating to people that there is uh, a green dividend from this rather than a green cost. Okay, Ed Dane. Before the nudge unit becomes the shove unit, um, let's look at particular groups of people who we can nudge along the way. I'm going to take motorists, I'm going to take farmers. On motorists, the key thing for adopt adoption of voluntary adoption is getting to ultra rapid charging. That's really key. All the evidence shows that. Um, the technologies for that are um, some that are quite expensive. Uh, but there's a, a firm in my constituency uh, who has a called Levistore, who have a wonderful product which will be on the market, I hope, in a few years' time. And it's not using uh, chemistry and battery charges, it's using flywheels. Flywheels uh, are a really very interesting source, and they've got a really new, new wacky idea, and I've seen it, and I'm really impressed by it. And I think flywheels, the, their, their idea, could lead to ultra-rapid charging, which would, I think, uh, be one big nudge or shove for take-up of electric vehicles. On farmers, you're gonna, you think I'm going to go completely crazy, but I like being a bit wacky at times. One of the issues is when is the cow taken to uh, the abattoir. Some farmers take them at 12 months, some take them later, even go up to 36 months. One clearly wants to look at the, uh, the, the value of the product and the quality of the beef, but we do know that the emissions come from the cow's burping. And if the cow is burping for only 12 months, rather than burping for 24 months, go do the maths. Okay, great. I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there because we need to let um, the Eds in particular go and vote right now. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Uh, you can watch back on YouTube if you've missed anything. No, it's and it's uh, please take a look at the Policy Exchange website, follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn to find more events. So just thank you very much to our panel thank and you. thank you to everyone thank for coming. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.